this college football season began, we saw upheaval at the conference level. Now we're seeing it in individual programs as certain schools face decisions with major ramifications very early in the season. It's Tuesday, September 17th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's episode, we're delving into the problems at Florida and Florida State and whether they will pay tens of millions to get rid of their coaches. Sports Grid's Joe Lisi and his encyclopedic knowledge of the game joined for that. And we have Kirby Hokut, athletic director of Texas Tech, on how they're responding to the changing college landscape. Later on, we're talking about Yannick Sinner and the Labor Cup with Patrick McEnroe. Plus, we have a report on the real motivation to sell the Boston Celtics. First, here are your top headlines. Lilia Vu birdied out on hole 18 to win the Solheim Cup for the United States for the first time since 2017. Team Europe won the cup in 2019 and 2021 and then held on to it last year due to a 14-14 tie. Bubba Watson was relegated out of Live Golf after failing to land in the top 48 of Live's individual standings. However, the two-time Masters champion is unlikely to be gone for long. Watson can be brought back as long as his team board, which consists of two Live Golf executives, can be convinced that there is a business reason for doing so. Given Watson's stature in the golf world and the fact that he is the captain of one of Lib's most successful teams, his return is all but a formality. On the other end of the Lib golf rankings, John Rahm closed out the season shooting a 62 at Lib's final individual tournament on Sunday. The score secured a first place finish at the tournament, winning him 4 million, and a first place finish in the season standings as well, which earned Rahm another 18 million. All in all, Rahm took home $22 million for his work on Sunday. Slightly more than I did. Bills fans rallied around Miami Dolphins quarterback Tua Tagovailoa after he suffered yet another concussion on Thursday night against the Bills. Within 24 hours after leaving Thursday's game, the Tua Foundation received nearly 1,000 donations, totaling almost $18,000, with many of the donations coming from in and around Buffalo. MLB helmets will feature advertising during this year's playoffs. MLB partnered with German apparel company Strauss to place their logo on the side of all MLB helmets during the postseason until 2028. The deal is spread to the minor leagues as well, with all minor league players sporting the Strauss logo on their helmets throughout the entire season starting in 2025. This marks the first time ever that an advertisement has appeared on an MLB or minor league helmet league-wide. Florida and Florida State have endured a very difficult three weeks with one win between them and two calls for head coaches to be fired. Doing so won't be cheap, however. I spoke with Sports Grid's Joe Lisi, who knows college football backward and forward on the state of those two programs, plus the news of Bryce Young getting benched. That conversation is next. Very excited to be joined now by Joe Lisi, co-host of the College Football Playoff Today on Sports Grid. Welcome, Joe. Hi, Owen. How are you? Just another day in the life of another college football week. Upsets across yes. the top 25 and another week of madness. Yeah, no, it's the, the fun never stops here. So, uh, except uh, it, it is kind of stopped in Florida. Things are not going well in, in either major school there. Let's start with Florida, as opposed to Florida State. They just lost 33-20 to 20 to Texas A&M. They're 1-2. and two. Last year, they went 5-7. and seven. Just before we get into, you know, the calls for uh, the coach to be fired and um, it, all the bad vibes, just like objectively, how bad is it there? Like, is this is this a program that's kind of stuck in second gear? I think it is right now. You look at Bill, Billy Napier's performance over the past three seasons entering this year. He's only 12 and 16 in terms of overall record, six and seven his first year, five and seven the year after that. And 10 of his 12 wins have come at home in Gainesville to lose that matchup this past Saturday to Texas A&M on a backup quarterback. You know, it's a terrible loss on the football field. Bigger picture, Owen. You know, this is one back-to-back national championships in the mid-2000s with Urban Meyer, Heisman Trophy winner Tim Tebow. The expectation is very high, not just in regards to on the field, but off the field with the boosters and the fan base. Is there anything you can point to where things went astray? Was it just kind of a slow drift that, you know, other schools kind of figured out this era before they did or anything you would point to in particular? Well, Florida has the money and they have the recruiting ability. I mean, the campus is beautiful and they have everything at their disposal. It started with Dan Mullen in regards to peaking the program. And ever since that time, they've been stuck in neutral, to your point. They haven't been very good on the football field. They've gotten top five recruiting classes, but they haven't been able to cultivate it in regards to coaching that talent up. And when you look at the SEC and you look at programs 
like Georgia and Alabama, obviously, and LSU with Brian Kelly and some of the newer programs with Tennessee, a younger coach, Josh Heupel, and even Eli Drinkwitz in Missouri. The expectation is to challenge for an SEC championship each and every year. And it's unfortunate that Billy Napier and the Gators haven't done that. Yeah, so let's get to Napier. He's good. The reported buyout is for $26 million right now. Uh, how long does he have? Uh, he's got to win this game this weekend uh, against Mississippi State. They haven't played since 2018. They're going on the road. Starkville is a very difficult place to play. They do have a first-year head coach, Jeff Levy. If they lose this matchup this coming Saturday in, in Starkville, I think Billy Napier will be gone. I think they'll be looking for a coach. It'll be an, uh, on an interim basis and who they get after this will be very important as to the success of the Florida program over the next two or three seasons. So these coach buyout figures, I mean, it's one of these things where I'm just my brain, I, I can't get used to it every time I see it, even though it's we've see, we see a lot of these. Um, is $26 million is 26 million for to get rid of Napier, a good use of Florida's money? Well, it, it it looked like that, right, when they when they signed them to the long-term deal, right? And, and in regards to the contract, we know that these coaches have these high buyouts, and to push them out, you're going to have to pay up as it regards to the fan base and the boosters. You're talking about a coach in Billy Napier that at Lafayette had a 40-12 and 12 winning uh, record, right? And, and he won multiple bowl games. He was a disciple of Nick Saban. So uh, all the optimism in regards to when you signed on the dotted line, the, the contract, the long-term deal, but they never look at the ramifications in terms of the downside. If it doesn't play out, can that put our program at a disadvantage for years to come? If they buy out Billy Napier from the $26 million, let's just say this week, they are then in an interim basis, and then they really have to turn their sights on a more key coach. You can't just get another group of five coach to potentially resurrect the program. It needs to be a marquee name, a name like Lane Kiffin or Dan Lanning, someone on that magnitude to bring the fan base back, or maybe even a Deion Sanders for that matter. But I think he's a better fit at Florida State. Yeah, interesting. Um, and yeah, let's get to, to Florida State. So uh, they are also thinking about buying at their coach for more like $65 million. Um, they might have to choose between, I mean, the money could have just show up for all things, but between getting rid of their coach or getting rid of their conference, essentially. I mean, obviously that's all tied up in lawsuits. We won't really know the full deal for a while there. What does this program do at this point? Well, it's unfortunate, right? Because last year they were deserving of making the college football playoff. They hired Mike Norvell four or five years ago from Memphis. His first couple of seasons, he was in fact on the hot seat. He got through that tumultuous time. He got them back on track a couple of years ago and took them to a 13-0 regular season record. They were uh, ACC champions. They were deserving of making the college football playoff, but because their starting quarterback, Jordan Travis, went down, they were snubbed a, mo a, a magnitude, a, a, an enormous amount of transition in regards to the players. They lost 14 players that didn't play in regards to the bowl matchup last year against Georgia. It continued this year. They couldn't really reload in regards to the transfer talent. And that's why Mike Norvell and Florida State right now are, are limping at an 0-3 record. They need to get it back on track. I do feel that Mike Norvell is on at least a little bit more stable than potentially Billy Napier because of Napier has never had success in Gainesville. At least Norvell Norvell was able to have it over the past couple of seasons, but it has to start this weekend against California. If they do not win this game, it's most likely he'll be on the outside looking in it as well. They'll buy him out. And then again, where does Florida State turn? This was a program back in 2013 that won a national championship with Jimbo Fisher, Bobby Bowden, second career winningest all-time coach. It's going to take a lot right now to get back on track I don't know where they go, but I think Dion could be an answer. Interesting. So, you know, once, you know, his his kids graduate and Travis Hunter moves on, you think Dion is effectively a free agent? I think it's it's dependent upon the success this season. If Co Colorado right now 2 and 1, they picked up a victory over Colorado State this past weekend in a rivalry type of setting. They do have a Big 12 opponent in Baylor. If they can get over 500, get back to a bowl game, I think Dion potentially could move on for maybe the NFL or even, you know, a, a major program. I think that's where we sit right now. If they limp again to a 4-8 overall campaign, 
miss out on a bowl game, I don't know if he'd be in the running. But if Shador Sanders does light it up be, be, and solidifies himself as a top five selection in the NFL draft, and this team is, let's say, eight and four, I think the money would talk and Dion would entertain maybe a move to Florida State, you know, where he can recruit and go back to where he played college ball back in 1989. I feel like, you know, in the NIL era, we're still kind of like calibrating how much goes to players and, you know, how much goes to coaches. And obviously we talk more about the failures than the successes. Mm -hmm. Do you think we're going to see any amount of pullback for these big coaching deals because sometimes they go sour pretty quickly? It's possible, but when does it, when does it stop? You could equate it to the NFL, right? In regards to when Daniel Jones got the $40 million at a quarterback level, people said, well, if you can give Daniel Jones $40 million, you certainly have to give 50 and 55 to Joe Burrow and Jalen Hurts, and now here we go. The list just keeps going on and on and on until that train stops and somebody puts an end to it, it's going to continue to go in motion, especially with NIL. You need a recognizable head coach in regards to the salary. Now, maybe it's not all guaranteed like some of these coaches have in regards to their contracts and the buyout clauses maybe won't be as significant, but you still have to lure big names to recruit big time athletes. And that's what it comes. It's a money train right now in college football. So, Coaches like Saban, coaches like Kiffin, Kirby Smart, they warrant those $10 and $12 million contracts because they recruit and they're able to coach that talent up and not just win national championships, Owen. It's getting the players to play at an NFL caliber level. That's what these kids want on top of the money. Leads right into to the last thing I wanted to ask you about. We just learned that Bryce Young is going to be benched uh, by the Panthers. Obviously, things not a lot's going well with, with Carolina. Did the expectations, were they just too high coming out of Alabama? Uh, is this Do we put this at the feet of the Panthers for not getting the most out of this talent? Like, what went wrong here? Yeah, I think it's twofold. I think you look at last year, and let's just talk quickly about Bryce Young's career in Tuscaloosa. Threw for over 8,000 yards, 70-plus touchdown passes, completed around 69% of his passes, took his team to the college football playoff. He was one of the best and most prolific quarterbacks in college over the past couple of seasons a few years ago. They drafted him number one overall, and Frank Reich, wanted to use Bryce Young in his scheme instead of developing a scheme to Bryce Young's strengths. So I think that really deterred his type of progression last year. Now they had a, a new head coach, a younger head coach, Dave Canales, that really mentored and cultivated Baker Mayfield last year. The two biggest and best quarterbacks at the end of the regular season last year in the NFL were Jordan Love and Baker Mayfield. And a big part of that was Dave Canales. So the fact that Bryce Young right now, in terms of week number two, hasn't grasped Dave Canales' scheme is a big factor. And the fact that he hasn't thrown a touchdown pass and is completing 55% of his passes, that's an, that's an area where I think the Carolina organization said, we need to make an assessment. Is he the guy or isn't he the guy? And they benched him, and we'll see how it plays out. He might get another opportunity, depending upon how the team plays with the backup. But if they're still under 500, maybe in the middle part of the season, maybe Bryce Young gets a second opportunity. Yeah, I mean, it just feels like they're still so invested in him. They, they, they gave him that number one pick. They traded up for it. Right. They have to give him another shot at some point. But yeah, but then he's got to show that he's worth that second shot. So I guess we'll see. Yeah, from a monetary standpoint, it, it, think about it. First round st a draft pick, right? The, the organization is investing that money. They're pour pouring millions of dollars into a top five overall assessment, right? They need to make sure that that is assessment pans out over the course of, let's say, five years, right? The rookie contract. However, they need to make a determination whether they're progressing in regards to that type of investment return, right? ROI. Think of it that way. So now uh, it's unfortunate, but younger quarterbacks have a shorter shelf life in the sense of if you don't perform in year number one or year number two, there's the p potential to move on because then the, the organization needs to understand we need a starting quarterback. We can't wait the five years like the New York Giants in terms of Daniel Jones. They signed them in terms of the extension, and he's a quarterback that can, might not be in, in, in the organization next year, and their head coach, Brian Dable, might be looking for a job in 2025. Yeah, a lot of question marks there. Joe Lisi, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Anytime. Love the show.
A medical test can reveal your body's biological age, which can show if you are aging prematurely. Better nutrition has been shown to reverse one's bio age. My hope of living longer and healthier is why I take Field of Greens. Field of Greens is an organic superfood fruit and vegetable drink unlike any other. It's serious nutrition. Listen to this. Field of Greens was approved for a university study that doctors believe may lower your body's biological age. That generally means better health. Each fruit and vegetable in Field of Greens was selected by doctors to support vital body functions like heart, liver, kidneys, metabolism, and immune system. Only Field of Greens is backed by this better health promise. At your next physical or checkup, your doctor will notice your improved health or your money back. Join me in better health with 15% off and free shipping. Visit fieldofgreens.com and use promo code FOS. That's promo code FOS at fieldofgreens.com fieldofgreens.com. The Boston Celtics have much of their championship winning core locked up with pricey contracts. And that, according to the New York Post, is why the team is being sold. The Post is reporting that there is a rift between Wick Grosbeck, the controlling owner who holds around 3% of the team, who wants to spend what it takes to keep the core intact, and Irving Grosbeck, his father, who doesn't want to lose tens of millions of dollars keeping his stars around. Irving owns around 20% of the Celtics and was reportedly not pleased to see the team give out extensions worth $314 million, $135 million, and $126 million to Jason Tatum, Drew Holiday, and Derek White on top of the $285 million deal to Jalen Brown last year. The team's roster will cost $225 million this season, but they will pay a total of $280 million for going over the luxury tax. After looking at that bill, Irving Grosbeck apparently decided he would prefer to cash out with what will be a record-setting sale. The family denies the Post report and maintains that the sale is being done for estate planning purposes only. The sale itself hasn't truly gotten underway because J.P. Morgan Chase and BDT and MSD, which are assisting with the sale, are still getting a full picture of the team's assets and liabilities, including all those mega contracts. There is reportedly interest from Steve Paliuka, who owns around 20% of the team already, and Fenway Sports Group. Elsewhere in the Eastern Conference, usually we see arena or stadium renderings when a team is trying to convince a city or state to give them money. In New Jersey, we're seeing the reverse. The New Jersey Economic Development Authority put out arena renderings to try and convince the 76ers to take their money. The state offers tax incentives of up to $800 million that would apply to a new 76ers arena. The state is also offering to ask for $500 million in special purpose bonds from the state legislature to further finance the project. The renderings show an arena on the Camden waterfront with Philadelphia visible across the Delaware River. In the renderings, it sits next to a very well-lit park and restaurant area. Renderings are fun, just don't get invested in them, because the actual design of the project would only start after the Sixers agree to make the move. The whole point of producing them is to get people excited about the potential project, but beyond that, it's just a pretty picture. Maybe Tom Brady just needed a game to warm up on the job he'd never done before. Fox's new lead analyst got much better reviews for his second game than his first. He was more willing to get excited, be critical, and tap into his experience during Sunday's game between the Saints and Cowboys. Last week, his lack of excitement got called out by NFL Red Zone host Scott Hansen, who later walked back his critique. On Sunday, he was both smoother and more amped up. He'll have as long a leash as anyone, but it's good that Brady is already settling into the role. Lead NFL analyst is a more selective job than NFL quarterback, and if Brady couldn't find his groove, he would have more people calling for his job than Billy Napier. Brady wasn't the only person willing to complain this weekend. NFL offensive players are not happy about how the new hip drop tackle rule is being enforced. Texans running back Joe Mixon took to social media to complain about not getting a call on a hip drop in his team's win against the Bears, saying, The NFL and NFLPA made it a rule and an emphasis for a reason. Time to put your money where your mouth is. The Bengals' Jamar Chase did not wait to get off the field to complain. He received an unsportsmanlike conduct penalty in a crucial spot against the Chiefs for complaining about not getting a hip drop call. It looks like the hip drop is going to be the new most complained about call, like holding and pass interference, until we get a feel for where the line is. Every FBS school has had to figure out how to operate in a world with players seeking NIL and before long revenue sharing, while the transfer portal makes their relationship with the school a tenuous one. I spoke to Texas Tech AD Kirby Hokut on how he's navigating these uncertain waters. I'm joined now by the athletic director of Texas Tech, Kirby Hokut. Welcome, Kirby. Owen, appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, appreciate you taking the time. So 
From the outside, of course, this has been a huge year of change in college football. You have conference realignment, uh, you know, ongoing effects of NIL and the transfer portal. What's been the biggest change for you? Well, Owen, that's a great question. And when you think about what's been the biggest change for me at Texas Tech, when you layer on top of the transfer portal, NIL, conference realignment, we just opened a brand new $250 million uh, end zone football center project uh, three weeks ago. On top of that, we just recently announced a new 10-year partnership with Adidas and the Patrick Mahomes brand. And uh, three weeks ago, we also wrapped up a successful $500 million uh, capital campaign. So we've had a, a lot going on. But as you look at the national scene, it's, it's just what you mentioned. It's, it's the new landscape that we all anticipate that is going to be in effect J July 1st of 2025 and the new revenue share model. So as we've navigated the NIL space, as we, as a Big 12 conference, are welcoming in four new conference members this year in Arizona, Arizona State, Colorado, and Utah. And if you just think back to conference realignment, we've welcomed eight new members into the Big 12 conference in the last two years. So, Owen, there's a lot that has been going on, and uh, we're trying to navigate it and make sure that we're growing at Texas Tech, that we're a leader in the spaces in particular that touch our student athletes and give us a competitive advantage. And do you feel like you have a basic understanding of the state of the conference, the state of how much money is coming in from these media deals and other, you know, big sources um, and what it's going to take to compete? Do you feel like you have the basic picture right now? I do believe I have the basic picture um, with a general understanding on where the house settlement is going to be. And, and I would first begin by saying, we're so fortunate to have a great conference commissioner in Brett Yormark. He has come in in less than three years and has done some tremendous things from conference growth to revenue generation to you know, really bringing a different mindset to the athletics director's table. And by that, I mean just challenging the way we think when we bring in business and music and entertainment and you cross that with sports. Uh, Brett has brought a lot to the table. But, you know, we know that the world in front of us is going to change. College athletics is not going to be the way that it was five years ago pre-COVID. And it doesn't have to be the way that it is today, but there's a new model coming. And, you know, we believe that we know, um, you know, to a pretty good idea what's going to be required to continue to compete at the national level going forward. Is the main difference just more money involved? And now that, you know, athletes are likely going to get paid directly on top of maybe some NIL money, oh, definitely some NIL money on top of that. Is that the biggest change? Well, it's, it's definitely one of the significant changes, right? And so as we look at it, um, you know, what can we do to continue to empower, empower our student athletes to grow, to continue to build their brand um, while continuing to offer a world-class experience at Texas Tech. And I've told our team, I've told our donors that, you know, there may be limited individuals in the future that are like Patrick Mahomes that come and spend four or five years at your university and you feel like they're one of yours. You watch them grow and you're so connected to them as they move on in their careers and in their journeys. But what I've told our team is, you know, even though Josh Kelly, wide receiver here at Texas Tech, may only spend one year at Texas Tech University, I want that to be the very best year for him in his college experience. So down the road when he looks back and he compares his experiences at Washington State, at, at you know, his other universities before that, I want Texas Tech to feel like his home and the place that he uh, wants to associate with because of the resources, the support that we offered him during his one year at Texas Tech. I'm just wondering if you have other thoughts on just the transfer portal era where it's like, yeah, any player might, that might be their last year, um, especially if they're kind of outgrowing um, either their NIL potential, you know, if they're obviously if they don't have a starting role and they, they think they can get it somewhere else um, or, or yeah, maybe they just, for whatever reason, um, that's just so available to, to every player right now. I mean, obviously it's a big opportunity to potentially get some talent on the, the transfer portal, but that's replacing the talent you're losing. 
what what's this uh, i mean is this a very stressful era like what how are you kind of processing um the state of the transfer portal yeah with a, an attitude of embracing change because you know it's it's happened it's not going to change it's going to continue to be in front of us you know the ncaa and i say the ncaa recognizing that that's us that's me as an athletic director in this nation we were very slow to act and you know we had what now is so obvious re ridiculous restrictions uh, upon our, our student athletes and where others were free to move in the marketplace if it was a coach or an athletic director uh, an assistant coach you know student athletes were were restricted from from doing that without without having to sit out a year so I embrace the new landscape and I want you know every young person in our program to have an opportunity to advance and accomplish their dreams athletically and you know, I just want to make it very hard on them because I want all of them to feel like our university, Texas Tech University, is the absolute best place for them to continue to grow and continue to learn and accomplish their their dreams. And, you know, now that NIL and soon to be revenue share is going to be uh, in the space, that's that's a part of it. And that's 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 my job to make sure that our donors and that we as a department are growing our commercial business that we're maximizing our revenue that we are maximizing fundraising to be at the you know the very top level that's permissible when it comes to revenue share or nil opportunities and that's why i'm so fortunate at texas tech that we've got such a uh, large generous supportive alumni and donor base yeah i was speaking to, to marty smith about these issues recently at espn and um, one an issue he he thinks is a significant one uh, for many athletic programs is donor fatigue, and because there's this big you know sudden need uh, for NIL dollars and you know, revenue sharing coming soon, um, do you think that's going to be an issue? And any and do you think we're going to see some amount of pullback in terms of either what athletes get paid, what coaches get paid, somewhere where the dollars we're seeing now won't be the dollars we're seeing a little bit in the future? Yeah, that's that's a uh, fair comment and one that you know I I've, I do think about frequently. And I mentioned earlier that we're uh, just wrapped up a, a five hundred million dollar capital campaign over the last eight or nine years. You know, here at Texas Tech, we're very fortunate that we enjoy such a large and passionate following. Oh, and you know what a lot of people don't realize is that Lubbock, Texas, uh, we're just an hour away from the Permian Basin, the largest oil field. Um, play in our country and you know we're very fortunate to have a high resource uh, constituent base that supports us but here's the, the piece that I would even jump back to your previous question on what we cannot do is lose the tie to higher education and I still 100% believe that participation in college athletics is complementing the education that has to continue to remain in the picture and in the conversation as we're talking to these young people because getting an NIL deal now, getting a large revenue share contract next year, those are important things. But the value of that degree and how that degree is going to impact these young people are going to be far um, much greater in their life than than their NIL deal, with the exception of a handful of athletes. So, you know, we've got to continue to stress to to our donor base that you're helping these young people grow to to gain an education, and you know we're going to maximize their benefits while they um, compete in college athletics. But yeah, donor fatigue. We're, we've got to continue to lean upon our our donor base to help us navigate this landscape and make sure we have the resources that match our vision and our goals. I'm very interested in that connection to higher education because uh, on one hand, you know, a very small number of these athletes actually go on to have a professional athletic career in the NFL or maybe elsewhere. Um, on the other hand, it feels like everything else about it feels like professional athletics from, you know, the money coming in, the media deals, um, you know, the transfer portal feels very much like free agency. Um, so do you feel like that connection to, to higher ed is still there right now? And is there any danger in it, in that connection becoming more tenuous? I'm just curious, yeah, like wh where do you see it right now? And uh, are there dangers present that could be uh, coming in with these new changes? 
Yeah, I, it's a great question, and I appreciate it, and it's something that I do think about. Do I think that education is still uh, prevalent within intercollegiate athletics? I do. I think that's incumbent upon us on our campuses um, and then through the NCAA at the national level to make sure that that education remains a center point of what we do. But it's changing, right, because of the reasons that you mentioned with the opportunity to transfer with NIL deals that are available. So it's, it's, it's changing. It is different, but I think that's more responsibility on us as athletic directors, as coaches, as academic support employees to be able to connect with these young people in in their space and make sure that they're prepared. If, if you do want to best position yourself at Texas Tech and things don't work out the way you want them to work out here on the basketball court or on the football field or the baseball diamond and you choose to go somewhere else, you need to take care of your academics so you have the progress towards a degree to graduate to that next university. So I think our conversations with our young people may have to change as we look into this new landscape, but I do believe that it continues to be an important aspect uh, to our enterprise and to what we do, and um, it will continue to be challenged in a lot of ways, but I, I just, I don't believe we can lose sight of that, how education is tethered to college athletics. Yeah, uh, I'm glad to hear you say that just because it, comes up surprisingly little in, in the conversations I have around this, honestly. Um, you mentioned this $250 million renovation a couple times uh, to your, your football center and uh, the South End Zone locker room. Uh, you know, given that you had $250 million to spend, what was your, you know, your pitch to the school, your donors, to everyone else? Why is this the way to spend that money or was it the way to spend that money? Yeah, so we, we continue to look to the landscape, and we want to continue to build our brand. We want to continue to compete nationally. We want to continue to build our facilities and our infrastructure and our resources to be successful in, in college athletics. And, Owen, oh, as you know, so much of that is tied specifically to the sport of football. So it was an opportunity, again, with such a great alumni and donor base that we enjoy here at Texas Tech to – to invest in football to make sure that we're prepared for the future. And of course, that's got to translate to Saturday afternoon, Saturday nights on the football field. But it's as we look forward, we knew we had to make sure that our football program has the optimal resources uh, to be successful. And that's what this project has done. That's what our NIL fundraising has done through the Matador Club. Uh, it's what our new relationship with Adidas, our continued partnership with Patrick Mahomes and other athletes is, is all about strengthening, strengthening that brand to best position us to be competitive in the future of college athletics. One change I haven't asked you about is this is the first year of the 12-team college football playoff. Does that change how you think about how you operate the program in any way? Well, it, um, it has sure sparked a, a lot of conversations, one about um, non-conference scheduling philosophy, um, strength of schedule. You know, we've talked at a conference, you know, when you go, when we were at 10 teams for so long as a Big 12 conference, you played a round robin. So you played every school every year. Uh, now with 16 teams, nine conference games, we don't play everybody every year. So it's, it's made us look at how we schedule from a conference perspective as well on campus, how we, what's our strategy to scheduling non-conference matchups. But at the end of the day, um, we know if we win the Big 12 Conference, uh, for one of the top two programs in the Big 12 Conference, we have a pathway to the 12 team playoff. And that's what our goal is. And um, you know, we're not gonna shy away from, from saying that. We wanna be in that 12 team playoff. We expect to be in that 12 team playoff. And uh, I think it's gonna be exciting for college football. I think it's had the greatest regular season um, of any sport out there. And I think this 12 team playoff is going to uh, just add to that. Uh, so we've had um, some high profile head coach buyouts, you know, like Jimbo Fisher last year. We may have some more this year. Um, um, if you know, the rumors are true. Um, how do you make that decision? You know, in terms of like paying one coach to not coach for you. And then, you know, then obviously you have to find a pretty high profile replacement. If, if you're opting to make that move, what are the sort of calculations that would go through your head in terms of whether or not to, to make that very impactful decision? Yeah, those, those are extremely impactful positions, Owen. I, you know, while not affecting us now, you know, we've had to navigate through some situations 
over the course of my career. And with that being said, um, you know, you, you don't do it alone. You do it in conjunction with your president, with your, your, your board of regents, uh, the chancellor, and you make the best decision for your university at that particular time. And, you know, again, it's hard to, to talk about any particular scenario because, again, no two situations are ever the same. But what you've got to continue to provide is confidence and hope with your fan base and confidence in your team and the young men that are in that locker room each and every day that you have a leader who's all in, who is passionate about winning, and who is going to love those young men on and off the field if we're talking about football here. So, you know, you, you know if you have that. The, the young men in your locker room know if that head coach, those assistant coaches that are leaving them, do they care for them? Are they all in with them? Do they care more about them uh, than just as a player? And are you are you being competitive? And you know, very r randomly, do teams win every game in a gi given season? And as we go to this 12-team playoff, we'll probably see less of undefeated seasons. So you're not going to win every game, but you want to win every day and, and make sure that you're doing all the right things to get better each and every day as a program. And ultimately, that's what ADs are charged with uh, navigating year in and year out. So when the Pac-12 basically fell apart over the last year or two, um, uh, and you know we then we were bound down to four power conferences, essentially, there's a lot of talk of eventually we're just going to have, you know, two, or, you know, like an FBF conference and an FCS conference. Now the Pac-12 is reconstituting itself. And uh, but, you know, other conferences could could face the same sort of difficulties. I mean, do you have any kind of sense of where we're headed? Are we going to stay with five, go down to two, or, or just like consolidation or whatever else? What do you see in the future? Oh, and that's a tough question. I, I think you, you have to recognize with conference realignment just – I believe how important college football is across our country, how important it is in all the communities that we live in and have these great universities. And I think as we've been in this decade plus, two decades of conference realignment being front and center, um, at some point we have to think differently. We have to look out for the uh, good of, of the whole and not individual. And that's in our current system that's challenging. Because as an athletics director, I am charged every day to grow and advance Texas Tech. And conference commissioners are charged with growing the revenue and serving their constituent group, their conference. Um, the NCAA has very little to do with college football at this level, if anything. And so who is who's thinking for the, the good of the whole product of college football? So I just think as leaders, we, we have to think differently. And I don't know what the future of conference realignment is, but, you know, as we speak, things have happened with the Pac-12 and the Mountain West. We're all watching what's taking place out on the East Coast with Florida State and Clemson with lawsuits against their conference. That never ends well, it doesn't seem like. Maybe this time's different, but I doubt it. But I would just hope that at some point we can find a group that will think differently and think about the product of college football and how important it is to our society and that we can start to think differently rather than just conference by conference survival and growth. Kirby Hokut, really appreciate the perspective. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. Yeah, Owen, thanks for having me. The tennis world has a new most polarizing figure after Yannick Sinner tested positive for a banned substance shortly before winning the U.S. Open. My colleague Colin Salow spoke to ESPN's Patrick McEnroe on that situation, the Labor Cup, and the influence of pickleball on tennis. Here's their conversation. Mr. Patrick McEnroe, thanks for joining us. Colin, thanks for having me. Getting ready to head over to Berlin in a few days, so super excited. It's going to be the last Labor Cup for me and my brother John, but uh, we've had a great run, and we're hoping to go out with a three-peat, win, win it one more time. Yeah, of course. Um, it was tough for Team World in the beginning, and now you guys have definitely gained momentum. Um, so the Lever Cup, like you said, is in Berlin, Germany, September 20 to 22nd. This is the seventh edition of the Lever Cup. I want to you know, go into the growth and what, what's going on with 
the Labour Cup, but I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the breaking news. Within the last 30 minutes, um, Rafael Nadal announced that he is going to withdraw from the Labour Cup. And I just wanted to get your thoughts. I know he's your opponent, essentially, uh, but I wanted to get your thoughts on, on that news. Well, it's disappointing, certainly, for, for Team Europe and, you know, for the fans. Obviously, Rafa's got so many fans all over the world. But I think, you know, knowing where he's been and knowing what he's been when struggling with, I think it was, you know, the right move. I did see what he wrote in his statement, which was, you know, he wanted to let someone else um, help the team, help Team Europe, because I think, you know, even even all things being equal, if you were healthy, indoor hard court is, is always the surface that he's struggled the most on, not just from a game standpoint, but also, I think, with his body and with the stopping and starting. So I think considering, you know, all he's been through in the last year, and, and I know he's been trying to come back over the course of the last few months, I think it was probably the right decision for him, but we're certainly going to miss him. You know, was, we were looking forward to seeing him just out on the court and hopefully he can um, get back out there and play a little bit by, by the end of this year. If not, you know, give it one more shot next year in 2025 because, because tennis certainly misses him. And, you know, he's been one of the all time icons of tennis and uh, very popular amongst, you know, his team and our team as well. We, we love Rafael Nadal. Of course, it's one of those things where, He's such a legend that it doesn't matter if you're competing against him. You want him to be there and be healthy. Other, you know, exhibitions in other sports, not necessarily, um, you know, like, for example, the NBA. They've they've had a hard time convincing their players to take the All-Star game seriously. And I think what I'm curious about is what are the, uh, the, the steps for growth other than just longevity that you could see for the for the Labor Cup that could get it to a point that it's as valuable as the way that right the Ryder Cup's perceived. Well, well, you mentioned the the Ryder Cup, and obviously we know the difference. The Ryder Cup is every other year, right? Um, and the Labor Cup is every year. So I think that's something you know possibly to be considered, or 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 maybe it's um you know maybe it's not the same year as an Olympic year. Um, you know, I think it would be good if they could organize, you know, the Davis Cup and the Labor Cup and, the, you know, the ATP Cup, is, you know, happens in Australia, men and women. You know, they're all trying to get a piece of the pie, the bigger pie, and they're all doing it every year. So would it be better for there to be a Labor Cup every other year or a Davis Cup maybe every other year? That, you know, that's something that I think should be discussed um and looked at because that may be the way to make all of them i look i think team events in tennis are great because we know the majors are individual and uh, you to me the more team events you can have that have a meaning to it and where the players can be rewarded for it both from a point standpoint and a, and a financial standpoint make a lot of sense because i think they're great for the game and they help grow the game um so that to me would be that but that's like a pie in the sky because to get the you know, the different organizing bodies together to agree on these things is what's always always proved challenging in professional tennis. We've had a lot of tennis professionals talk about um, their kind of push, pushing back on the tennis schedule, whether in the men's and women's side. What do you think could be a solution to this, if, if at all? Um, and will it help ultimately not just tennis at, uh, at large, but the Labor Cup's growth? You know, Colin, they've been talking about the schedule in tennis for like 50 years, okay? Let me let you in on a little secret, all right? Nothing really that significant is going to change. They tweak it. They come up with maybe, you know, the season actually ends a little bit shorter for the majority of the players, 98% of the players. And I think that's a good thing. There's more money in the bigger tournaments now. So you don't, if you're a top player, you don't have to play as much. Players like me, by the way, that were sort of journeyman type players, we want a lot of tournaments because that's the only way we can make a living and make more money. You know, it's easy for the top players to miss some tournaments. Easy, I mean financially. And here's what it comes down to, Colin. It comes down to the players themselves, you know, and, and this is one of the reasons you saw the longevity of, of Djokovic, of Feder, of Serena, is that they picked their spots. They had they said no to certain events at certain times so that they could take time off, take a month off after the Australian Open, let's say, and not play three tournaments indoors or take time off after Wimbledon, for example. Now, again, they had the luxury of doing that from a financial standpoint, but that's really the, the best way for players to deal with this. You know, people want to see big events. The Labor Cup is a big event. 
Um, the U.S. Open was an unbelievable success this year, over a million people for the first time ever coming through the gates. The majors are bigger and better than ever. The Masters events are better than ever. So, you know, for Iga Sviantek to complain about the schedule being too long, I have some very simple advice for you, Iga. You just take time off when you need time off. Let the calendar continue. Most players want options and opportunities to play. Team events are great. So you have to pick your spots when you're Iga Sviantek and you're playing to try to win majors. You have to look at your schedule a little bit differently than a player who's ranked 40 or 50 in the world. Of course, right before the U.S. Open or, or within the U.S. Open, the, the controversy about Yannick Sinner did come out with his, um, you know, not being suspended, getting a fine for the the doping that he was tested positive for back in March. Um, just your overall thoughts on that and whether um, it was a you know a righteous decision, and as well if that will be a stain on Sinner moving forward. I think it was a righteous decision. Um, I think it will not be a stain on Sinner. Uh, he went through the process exactly as he was allowed to do and what the process is. Did he have better lawyers and smarter people behind him maybe than some other players and more resources so that he could legitimately fight it the way um, he wanted to and prove to this tribunal that he was innocent? I mean, so I'm not an expert on doping, nor am I an expert on, you know, massage, you know, uh, of uh, uh, this, you know, clostebol getting into your system. So we have to, we, and I mean, we collectively in the tennis world or outside of the tennis world, we have to trust this, the process. I mean, we have no other choice. We could take shots at it like many people have done and say, oh, you know, it was a, it was a masking thing or, you know, he must have been doing something else. Well, there's no proof of that. He, you know, tennis players get a lot of tests. They test, they get tested a lot. And they decided that they, they believed his story. He, he had, you know, uh, uh, his people on his team, you know, also said, this is what happened. And the, uh, apparently the amount of the, the drug that was in his system was so minuscule that it would have had, even if he did it on purpose, would have had absolutely no impact on his performance. So again, you know, I, I'm going to trust the process until it's proven to me that it's wrong. And that's that's the only thing I can go go about. Now, obviously, players are upset about the fact that other players maybe didn't have the same process. But as far as I can see, other players did. They just didn't know how to how to how to fight it the way that Yannick Sinner did. And, you know, everyone you have to you know, I read the whole report very, very diligently and clearly. I mean, there's there's details in it. You can't just say, look, I go out and talk to people, Colin, all the time, and I tell the the, 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 the headlines of the story and people roll their eyes because they've heard this before. Oh, oh, sure, sure, he got it in from his trainer. Well, if you actually read the report and go through the details, which is what I did as a, you know, I think as a proper journalist or ESPN employee, um, it's hard not to agree with the decision that they came to. Yeah, I mean, obviously a very contentious topic, but thanks for being very clear about, you know, what you read, what you research and where you stand. It's a heavier one, but I'm going to end with one kind of lighter thing. Um, a couple of months ago, I went on my YouTube chat. I went on YouTube and I saw you on The Daily Show with Michael Costa. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. And you were guessed, you guessed it there because there was a conversation about, you know, the growth of pickleball. Right. And how it's come in and infiltrated, I guess, society and essentially maybe even taken a little bit from tennis. I wanted to get a, a little bit more of a serious answer, but on, on what your thoughts are on that. Is is pickleball something that's bad for tennis or do you think that there's a way where these things can, can, can work together? Well, first of all, it was amazing to be part of that. And Michael Costa is uh, hilarious and a great guy and he supported – our charity at our tennis academy to help um, fund our scholarship kids. So I appreciate that. And they got an amazing team there. So they, they feed you lines and, you know, it's amazing how they put it together. So they made me, they even made me look funny, which is not easy to do. Uh, I love pickleball. I don't play it that much. I, I like to play tennis, but I think pickleball is great for tennis. Really. We, I'm here at our tennis academy. I just came, we, we just built another 10 courts. We have 30 courts. They're packed with kids playing tennis from now until the, tonight. We have pickle. We we just built pickleball permanent pickleball courts. 
people love pickleball too. So to me, they help each other. And by the way, don't just listen to me. I, I mean, I'm giving you what I, you know, I see in my own the business that I'm involved with here, which is a tennis tennis business, you know, a local tennis business in New York City. And it's all good. And it's helping tennis. And then not to mention the fact that every tournament I go to, I'm the president of the International Tennis Hall of Fame in Newport, Rhode Island, a small professional tournament. It was sold out every day. People come in to see the tournament. People come into our induction ceremony. Then, of course, as I mentioned earlier, the U.S. Open and the growth and the interest and the people come into the U.S. Open. So if you think this is hurting tennis, you must be smoking something. Because I don't see how it's hurting. Not only is it helping in participation, which has gone up exponentially since the pandemic hit in tennis. And I see that in, a, in our own academy, in our own clubs. But it's helped the professional game as well. So good, God bless pickleball. Um, you know, whether it's going to end up being a, a big time professional sport, I have my doubts about that. But um, it's a great sport. I encourage people to get out and do anything. Take a walk. Play tennis. Play badminton play baseball, play pickleball. And I see a lot of people in New York City playing in the parks, pickleball, because it's easier to pick up and you don't need as much room. So I, I say, you know what? It's all good. I think it's hilarious, like this pickleball tennis, you know, battle. I think it's just way overblown. And I think we can all live in the old sandbox very well together. Um, it was so fun to watch you there. And it was it's pretty cool to be able to hear about it um, from you now after watching you on The Daily Show. Uh, but once again, this was a, a great conversation with you, Patrick. Uh, we talked about the, the Labor Cup, which is on September 20 to 22nd in Berlin, Germany. And we look forward to you be as vice captain and your brother as captain for the last time um, for in the seventh edition of the Labor Cup. Thanks again for joining us, Patrick. Thank you, Colin. Thanks for having me and Team World for the three-peat, baby. Time for Front Office Sports tomorrow, where we look ahead to what's coming in the business of sports. Legislators from New York and Connecticut have proposed legislation that would have major implications on sports betting. Representative Paul Tonko and Senator Richard Blumenthal introduced a bill that would ban in-game advertisements and prop bets on college athletes. The measure would also ban the use of credit cards to fund sports betting accounts, as well as the use of AI to track bettors' gambling habits. Blumenthal intru introduced the bill as a matter of public health saying it is a matter of stopping addiction, saving lives, and making sure that young people particularly are protected against exploitation. As you might expect, the bill faces heavy opposition from the gambling industry. The American Gaming Association said in a statement that, introducing heavy-handed federal prohibitions six years into legal sports betting is a slap in the face to state legislatures and gaming regulators who have dedicated countless time and resources to developing thoughtful frameworks unique to their jurisdictions. Blumenthal has a point here. Gambling is going to have real negative consequences for some number of people who partake, and treating it like a controlled substance, especially around college athletics, makes some sense. At the same time, this is not the federal regulation gambling operators have been asking for, and this would obviously hurt their profits. I'm curious what you all think here. Shoot us an email at today at frontofficesports.com to give your take. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, please share it with a friend and let us know your thoughts by sending an email to today at frontofficesports.com. You could be featured on the show. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.